distinguished lecture series of this semester. Uh, we are honored to have uh, Eva Tardo as a speaker today. Um, so Eva has done some pretty fundamental and amazing work in, uh, in the intersection of combinatorial optimization, uh, mathematical programming, and theoretical computer science, and now uh, in computational economics. Uh, she is the chair of the computer science department at Cornell. Uh, she is, I'll just read out her list of honors and it's pretty impressive. She's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's an ACM fellow, an INFORMS fellow, a Guggenheim fellow, a Packard fellow, a Sloan fellow, an NSF presidential young investigator. And uh, for her uh, PhD dissertation, which was on the first strongly polynomial time algorithm for uh, minimum cost flows, uh, she won the uh, Fulkerson Prize, which is given by the uh, operations research community once every three years. Uh, and uh, in 2006, she won the prestigious Danzig Award. Um, and uh, she's the editor-in-chief of Sam Journal of Computing and an editor of several other journals. And today she's going to speak about her work on uh, uh, computational economics, particularly games and networks. So with that, I hand it over to Eva. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, the nice introduction. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit of, about games and networks, and I guess talking to people today, I realized that this is a somewhat of a mixed audience, and I'm sure for each of you there are some parts that you have already seen and uh, some parts that uh, hopefully will be new, I hope. Um, I guess my interest in this area came about the inter interest in games by the computer science community, which is growing into a big area, or, or at least a, 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 a sizable segment of the computer science community, and is, is catching interest in, also in the economics community. Uh, Kamesh uh, characterized it as, as computational economics. I haven't actually, and I'm not going to talk so much about computational issues, though at the end I'm going to uh, talk about, as a list of open problems or a list of other areas, uh, some things I'm thinking about that's explicitly computational. It's at the intersection of computer science and economics, sometimes without it explicitly being computational. It's computer science in part because it's motivated by interest in computer science. So if you're coming from a computer science uh, perspective, um, I guess, first of all, I should uh, tell you what a game is. And I guess what I mean is strategic behavior by players, by, by, by people who behave in situations. And I'm thinking of strategic behavior such as uh, parts of the internet or parts of any sort of network system, like browsers and servers or, or any, of, any part of the internet is behaving in a strategic way so as to optimize the experience of its own users for whatever reason. Um, and I guess this is, the, this is what came, gave computer scientists the idea of using uh, games as a model for strategic behavior and, the game, and modeling networks such as the internet, um, and hence the title games, in, uh, games on Networks. So our model of selfishness will be that users trying to optimize, or, or players trying to optimize their own behavior, or maybe better thought of as a behavior of, of, behavior of their users. Um, we assume that people deviate uh, to, uh, from any prescribed protocol if it's an interest to do so, but they don't deviate to maliciously hurt other players. So I'm not modeling behavior here that who's designed to hurt the be experience of other users. I'm modeling behavior here that's designed to optimize my own, own experience or, or my, my uh, person's behavior experience. Um, there are a couple of different areas uh, that I have um, worked on, and I'm going to actually combine two papers for uh, this talk. I guess in the fundamentally, I'm motivated, or have been a lot of this work has been motivated with a 
question that's fundamental, and I think there's a lot more work that our community should do to understand this question, that we want to somehow understand the obvious success of these networks, such as the internet, that obviously is an amazing success, in game theoretic terms. So I want to understand what were the principles, or what are the principles that behind motivating or behind really making this network work. There's a lot of uh, situation in which self-interest can ruin systems. We know a lot of simple examples where, such as maybe the tragedy of the commons, where self-interested players ruin their own experience. Uh, and for some reason, it doesn't appear to be happening on the internet. And it would be great to understand why it's not happening, in particular in light of we want to make sure that we have policies that it won't be happening in the future either. Um, sorry. Thank you. So one aspect of the internet is that multiple users somehow, multiple players on the internet cooperate to even have the internet as a network. There is no owner of the internet. The internet's comprised of many little internets that somehow combine to be the real internet. There are ISPs, many, many ISPs that have their own domains. And somehow they have policies that makes them cooperate and have a, give us the experience that we now think of as the internet. Um, to model this, I'm going to come up with a very simple um, a cooperative game to build a network. This only models one simple aspect um, of what the internet is, and there are many other issues that, that are worth looking at. Uh, my main question in all of this is to try to measure the degradation of performance uh, caused by selfish behavior. So as in, as in often the case in game theoretic models, it's also going to be the case here that selfish users uh, or self-interested users will not be building the optimal system. So you can think of optimal system design as sort of a network design, a, a well-established area of computer science. You give parameters of what, way, what network you want, and usually want the network to be high performance, cheap, or some other parameter. Here's, here, the right measure will be that we want our network to be cheap. Selfish users here will be not building a very cheap network, or certainly not the cheapest network. What we're going to ask is, um, how cheap, how expensive is an equilibrium compared to the cheapest possible network they could have built? So what's the performance degradation caused because uh, people behave selfishly? Uh, there are many other issues, and I'm going to touch on um, a little bit of just telling you what kind of things I'm working on at the end of the talk. I'm very interested in exploring models of, of cooperation or collusion. It's up to you which way you call this, um, but I guess but I, uh, and I'll come back to that at the end of the talk, um, I will not that much come back to, but I'm happy to talk to you about many other issues. For example, equilibrium selection. The model I'm talking about will have multiple equilibria, and we'll get to think of which one we want to think about. Uh, there are um, interesting ways to think about which one is the right equilibrium to select. And I would have to admit, and I'll do admit this again at the closing of the talk, that the model I'm using is very, very simplistic. There are a lot of other um, things I'm not mentioning, such as usually things get priced, and the price has something to do with it. Our model will be very simple. And one should explore more complex models that model bigger segments of life, such as prices and markets, among other things. So here is a very simple model that uh, I have used in my work in actually uh, multiple setups, which you'll see, uh, is a simple uh, load balancing model. I have two pictures, which are supposed to tell you uh, two facets of the very same story. On the top, you're supposed to think of driving a car from S to T, and it's a congestion-based routing model. You have two options for a road. You either can drive on the upper road or the lower road, and it is a congestion game that is uh, people's experience in driving depends on the congestion on the pass they chose. If they chose the upper pass, that's a congestion-sensitive pass, and what I'm supposed to be denoting there is that the latency, L, is, in that silly example, is linear in congestion. That is, the X amount of users go on the pass, their delay is X. In contrast, the lower pass is delay, uh, congestion insensitive, delay is 1 no matter what. So faced with this choice, um, people can, or the users can choose a path. 
just to see right away that there are many other scenarios that you can say the exact same story, I basically repeated the story on the lower picture, except that that time it, that time it called jobs and load balancing. Uh, here there are blue jobs that have to choose between green servers. And again, we assume that experience, in which case I guess call experience may be called response time of the server, is congestion sensitive. There is some sort of function, LE of x, that is the functional way of expressing whether server E, how it responds to congestion. If x amount of congestion occurs, it will have LE of x amount of congestion. Um, and again, the game will be that the users, whether they're car drivers or, or owners of these jobs, will choose a server or a rat in which they minimize their own delay or response time. Um, this is called a congestion game. And what makes it called a congestion game is, I used already the word congestion, and it's that your experience solely depends on the congestion of the things you chose. Uh, it's a function of the congestion. Uh, to maybe tell you what an equilibrium is, and maybe this is not needed for anyone, but it can maybe just safe to, to repeat, is that if I look, look at the upper, upper red picture, I have two people, two, the user splitting traffic 50-50%. This was the, my picture with the X, the congestion sensitive and congestion insensitive link, and this traffic was split 50-50 between the two links. This is not an equilibrium because the people using the congestion insensitive link are suffering too much delay. I guess I changed units here and all of a sudden you should think of a hundred minute delay that you're suffering. If you're one of those guys, hundred guys, one of those 50 guys with the hundred minute delay, you might think you're unhappy because if you only joined your other fellows on the other side, then you only had 50 minutes delay, that would be a lot better. Uh, and the only uh, stable solution or MV free solution is the one where everyone chooses the congestion sensitive link and you can't be too surprised to what happened. They congested it up. So now that's equally bad to the other one. They balanced out the two links. Uh, now this is an equilibrium. No single user can make his life happier by changing. But as you realize, no one is better off. Um, they all chose, um, they congested up the link. What really happens is that as you choose to not congest the link, you're not helping yourself, you're helping the others. Okay, you, 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 you're insensitive to switch, but it helps everyone else. So what this model says, uh, users minimize personal latency. That is the sole objective function, or in other models, I will use cost as the sole objective function. They do not care about the experience of the others. Um, so I'm going to use this notion of equilibrium, which is otherwise known as a Nash equilibrium. The current strategy is best response for all players. Um, to the current state of the affairs. No one has incentive to change strategy. What's nice about Nash equilibrium that it exists, uh, as proven by Nash in 52. Um, it normally exists in randomized strategies. In our game, it will exist in pure strategies. Um, and what I'm going to be mostly interested in is this term that I referred to earlier, but let me define it formally, that I call the price of energy, uh, named by coin uh, coined by Kutsupias and Papa Dimitriou, that the cost of the selfish outcome, namely the Nash equilibrium, compared to a socially optimal design. Okay, that's, that's what I'm really talking about uh, in a way from beginning to the end in different models. Um, so our delay, our, our, we can think of this as either a delay and rotting model, which is where I started, or in a minute we're going to think of this as a cost model. If I think about a delay and rotting model, I should tell you that every car has an origin and destination called source i and destination ti. And every edge has a latency function. And if they choose to drive on many you know, edges, they choose this, this road and then that road, they, of course, collect, collect up the latency functions. When you think of this as delay, you might want to have a delay function that's monotone increasing with congestion. The more congested the road gets, the slower it gets to drive. That's usually a fact of life, or it's a reasonable model. Uh, I'm not putting explicit capacities in the system. That is, I, do, I allow arbitrary numbers of users on any edge. But if you want to model capacities, you can do so, as the picture wants to suggest. Namely, you can make the delay go up to infinity as you approach the capacity. Then at some point, it's just so slow that people will stop using it. It's an implicit modeling of capacities. OK, 
Okay, so that's a basic routing model, and I'll come, maybe come back to it, or we'll come back to it a little bit. Um, I promised at the beginning that we're actually not talking about routing, we talk about network formation, so let me talk about network formation. So if you want to talk about network formation, I want to think of, again, I tried to illustrate it with a picture, there's a graph of all the possible edges that we could include in our network. There are, these are edges that we may or may not want to have. They have a cost to build, and right now we're considering whether or not to build it. I'm a little bit more general and give you, a, again, a congestion-sensitive cost for the edge. We say that the cost of edge E is CEX if X number of users want to use the edge. You, if you want, you can think of it as a fixed cost. It doesn't matter how many users. If you rather not, you can think about it as a monotone. More users cost a little bit more money. Uh, but I would like to think of it as a, oops, what happened? I don't know what happened to my slides. I want to think about it as a, hmm, sorry, you have to go with that visual aid for a second. Oh, I see. Um, so what we're going to give is every user will want to have, and again, that's a simplicity in the model, every user will have a certain points that it would like to connect. So again, indicated by colors, there is this, orange kind of user and the blue user, there's a bunch of locations it wants to connect. So if you want to think of such a users, it might be named AT&T. AT&T has locations on the West Coast and the East Coast and a couple other cities. Every one of those AT&T locations is a dot. And you want a private network that connects up its locations. Uh, if you're uh, uh, IBM instead, you also have a similar network. Those are maybe the orange dots. You have an IBM location in, in um, New York and in Maybe down here, too. Is there IBM here? Yeah, down here, too, in Israel, a whole bunch of places. So every company owns a bunch of these dots and wants a network to connect those dots. And you need to think about it, at least the way I'm going to think about it. The objective function is simply cost. You have to connect these places. There is no such thing that the current IBM location is not connected to the IBM network. That's not an option. The cost is the only objective function. The connectivity is a constraint. You need to have it connected. Okay, that's the game. Now, in order to define a game, I have to talk about cost, and I'm going to use economy of scale in my cost. I will assume that the cost of an edge is monotone increasing with the number of users, but does so obeying the economy of scale rules that is twice as many users don't cost twice as much money. Okay, so it's a concave function on the number of users. There is one more thing I have to tell you to make it a game. I have to decide that if people are sharing a link, which is part of what my picture suggests, the green users and the orange users somehow both want to use the link over the Atlantic, Atlantic Ocean going to someplace, Europe, uh, how are they going to share the cost? And the simplest proposal for how to share the edge cost is called fair sharing. And if you want, I can derive it from the Shapley cost sharing. Uh, though I guess with economists in the room, I sometimes run into trouble with this. So if you have a question about the Shapley reference here, maybe it's better to take it offline. Um, so equal cost sharing, and what's equal cost sharing is that if there are K companies that sharing a link, they each paying one over K share of the cost. That's the formula I wrote up there. If they K E users on link E, then the cost is C E times C E K E, and I divided by K E to get the individual users. So if you're bothered by the cost increasing with the number of users as a too complex a model, you're welcome to think of the cost as independent of the number of users. It's a number CE. And if they're K users, everyone pays 1 over K fraction of that cost CE. Uh, this cost has been originally suggested by, in a SICOM paper by Herzog, Schenker, and Estrin for its simplicity. It's simple to implement in a network. But it has other economic motivations. Uh, mostly derived from the fact that this is the Shapley value. Um, what's nice for us, that this is another congestion game. The cost for an edge simply depends on how many other people are on the edge. It's a congestion game uh, which has some similarities to routing and some differences from routing. Um, again, you may want to think of the cost as growing in, in number of users or not growing in number of users. The most dominant feature here for me is in this model, cost decreases with congestion, right? This is a way where you, it's a coordination game. You want people to actually 
share links because there's economy of scale, sharing, sharing makes things cheaper. But that means that even though the cost for an edge is going up, it's going up less than linearly. So by the, if you divide by the number of users, you're actually decreasing the cost. So it's almost like the ratting model with one fundamental difference. Con delay on ratting increases with congestion. This one is decreasing with congestion. Um, oh, actually, I had a slide that explicitly says that. Sorry. So I want to put these two models side by side, and then I try to tell you some of the things that we can do with these models and how it applies to either. So there are two kinds of models I'm talking about. Both are congestion games. So if you like congestion games up front, then these are both classes of congestion games. One, I think about it as a ratting game. And the dominant feature of ratting is that it increases with congestion. And one, I think about the fair sharing or, or network formation game with fair sharing, where it's also a congestion game, but cost decreases with congestion. There are other technical differences in routing, one often naturally think of the traffic as continuously modeled. One car, one internet packet is so small that we might as well think of it with continuous mats. In the fair sharing game, I think of big companies, and they're not trillion billion big companies. That's probably better modeled as an integral uh, problem with uh, atomic choices. Um, in part, I want to tell you that potential functions give you a powerful technique which um, dates back to, I don't know if I should date, at least date back to Rosenthal in the 70s, but as you see, it actually dates back to even longer to the 50s, and that it actually answers some of the questions that people on the 70s and 50s weren't asking about the quality of the optimal solution, quality of a Nash equilibrium, which is the question I want to mostly ask. So what's a potential function? A uh, potential function, I guess if you're an economist, and I think you know it from this context. If you're a computer scientist, you probably know it from online algorithms, if not from also this, this context. is a magical function with the property that it changes uh, in a very coordinated way as, as people change uh, strategies or as you make moves, namely that the potential function decreases whenever a user decreases its own cost and decreases by the right amount, exactly the amount that user decreases its cost by. What's magical here is that it ignores all other users, and when someone else is turned to move, then it decreases again by his happiness. In order to have this magical property, you need a little bit crazy potential function, but it's not that bad. Uh, in the R context with congestion game, the potential function is that you take all these congestible elements, and for every one of them, pretend that the users arrive one at a time, and they all recorded the experience in this one at a time fashion. That is, you take the congestion of the first user when he's alone, then the congestion of the second user if there are two of them, and then the congestion of the third user when there's three of them, and so on, and add that up. You have to realize that this is a rather artificial function. Every user suffers the last congestion. But this is the function we write up anyhow. Um, this, this is, it's rather simple to show you that this is indeed has the magical potential function property. So I have a slide here showing you why that is uh, in a sketching kind of way. So suppose there's a user. You think of this red pass. It's choosing on edge E. And it's thinking about switching to the lower pass with the E prime in it. The potential function looks like this. And I wrote down two things for the potential function. I wrote down the potential function value on edge E and the edge E prime. The new, old edge it used and the new edge it would like to use. And I just wrote functional form. Um, what happens as the person chooses is that, or switches pass, is that the last element goes away from the edge E and an extra element shows up in edge E plus, e plus 1, which I wrote there. And what you need to notice is that this change in the potential function is precisely the change in the player's, in, in, is the experience the player has. It used to have the delay of the last, ex, last element of the potential function on edge E, and instead it will have the delay of the next, next element on the potential function on edge E plus 1. So indeed, the experience of the user who changes is precisely the change of the potential function. And what's nice about this potential function is that the ordering of the people or the humans involved here are not, is not important. After I move and the potential function moves with me, if I now give Vince a chance to move, 
then for now on, Vint's going to be sort of as the last element on that list, and his experience will be modeled by the potential function. So it's important for this kind of thing to work that we're all indis indistinguishable, and whoever moves, I always can think of him as the last element in the summation. OK, so this is what potential function um, is. If you want to think of those continuous games, and maybe you have a continuous maths background, you might want to realize that in continuous games, life is even better that instead of a discrete summation of people arriving one at a time, you should have taken an integral, which is obviously the continuous analog of that discrete sum, but it's often easier to work with. Um, what potential functions have traditionally been used for by Rosenthal, uh, certainly, is to argue that pure equilibrium exists. You could do that pretty easily. Uh, either by saying that if I minimize the potential function, that minimum is obviously a pure equilibrium. If it wasn't a pure equilibrium, someone would want to move. That person's utility would decrease, and hence the potential function would decrease. It's already minimum. It can't be decreased. Or else argue that repeated best response gets you a Nash equilibrium. This is better works on a discrete setting, but it's equally clear. Um, be repeated best response decreases the potential function. Sooner or later, you can't decrease it anymore. There must be some limit, so it's going to reach a pure Nash equilibrium. What I want to make you realize, and, and I guess in honestly here, I, I kept dropping that 50 reference from Beckman, but here actually this has been used by the Beckman reference in 56 is actually on traffic routing. Beckman was thinking about traffic routing, and but he realized that in the continuous model, if, the, if there's a network with latency functions that monotone increase with delay, which is what traffic routing guy modeled, then there's a deterministic Nash equilibrium. Um, he also realized that it's essentially unique. Um, this happened also as a byproduct of this model. Um, what these users accidentally are minimizing is an is a, uh, objective function with these integrals on it. The integrals define a convex function and hence have unique, or strictly convex function and hence have unique uh, optimum. Um, what I want to use it for is to actually quantify the quality of the solution. And here is what I want to do. I want to say that consider minimizing this artificial function phi, the potential function, and Say, OK, that's a Nash equilibrium, and that's a high quality or a good quality Nash equilibrium, the one that minimizes the potential function. Now, why would it be a high quality equilibrium? Well, it depends. But in many applications, as I'll show you in a minute, this phi function, as crazy as it was, it's actually not very far from the real cost function. So what I wrote on the, board, on the slide here is that suppose the cost and the phi function differ, differ by a multiplicative ratio of A. You know, it's sometimes sort of like the cost and sometimes a little bit less, but it's never worse, more or less than a factor of A. It's between the cost and A, and a times the cost. So the phi function is, suppose, closely related to the cost by this factor of A. Now what we get here, that these users in the uh, simple self-interested manner are minimizing a phi function rather than minimizing the cost. Lucky thing. The phi function is almost the same as the cost by up to a factor of A, and therefore they're doing the right optimization by up to a factor of A. Okay, this is a pretty simple argument. Now you might wonder what on earth A was, uh, because after all, didn't I say that it was a crazy function? So let's go back with those integrals. That's in part why I admitted to you that the integral is a simple way to do things. So for example, if I have the cost is um, this delay, L E, delay on edge E for traffic F. Then our potential function on that particular edge was the integral. And the cost was F amount of flow experiencing L E F delay, L E L times F. Um, now, how different are these? For example, when the delay is linear, which was my simple example, so x amount of traffic gets x amount of delay, then the cost is L, f times lf, that's f squared. The uh, potential is the integral, that was s squared over 2. It's a factor of 2. It's not the same thing, but it's only a factor of 2 difference. Um, this gives us a price of energy band of 2. If you use d degree polynomials, by the very same argument, you get price of energy band of d plus 1. Exact same thing. One is the d times x to d versus integral of x to d minus 1. 
Um, now, you, you, it's interesting to realize that these bands, both the 2 and the d, d plus 1, is almost tight. This is almost the truth. Um, in Actually, by now, a number of years ago, Tim Ruffgard and I proved that with linear delays, uh, the worst price of energy is a factor of 4 thirds. The price of energy band gives you a 2. 4 thirds better than 2, but not a lot better. And maybe more prominently, uh, using a theorem of Tim Ravgard a few years later, he showed that on any network, on any class of convex continuous delay function that are monotone increasing, the worst price of energy always occurs on a two edge pass, that is users choosing between two options. And if you actually compute that, what happens to d degree polynomials, the correct price of energy is d over log d, and I got d plus one. So it's almost right. It's very close to being right. So it's a very simple proof, proof technique, but it does give you, I guess I'm going to skip this. It does give you a very powerful, almost correct result. Going back to um, cost sharing, it actually gives you the right results. Not even almost right results, but even up to constants and details, it gives you the right results. So here's what happened in cost sharing. Um, this is an example of cost sharing. The total edge cost is in the example going to be a fixed C. This is simply for simplicity of the example. So the cost is now not, not sensitive to congestion. But remember, my personal cost always is, because I divide by the number of users. I'm using my cost share. So every edge here has a fixed cost. There are two edges, edge costing 1 and the edge costing k and k users. Quite unpleasantly, there are two equilibria here. There is the good equilibrium. Uh, in which the users need to coordinate on the cheaper edge, paying 1 over k each. And then unpleasantly, there is the bad equilibrium, in which the users dumbly enough coordinated on the bad outcome and paying uh, k each, one each. This is also an equilibrium, because I'm not talking about collusion here, and they can't switch over. So what does our proof technique tell us in this uh, cost-sharing word? Um, what it tells us is that the best equilibrium, namely the better of these two guys over there, is very good. It does so because what our proof technique wants to tell us is that the equilibrium which minimizes the potential function had good quality. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, in this two uh, choice case, the equilibrium that minimizes the potential function is the good guy, not the bad guy. So what our theorem says is that the equilibrium that minimizes the potential function has cost, unfortunately, not constant up from the optimal, but a log k factor up for k users. So this is something that we decided to name the price of stability. It's instead of taking the worst possible equilibrium, I took the best possible equilibrium. And before I go on to tell you either examples of, or any other um, next slide, Maybe we should stop here. Do we care about the best equilibrium? So it's a good question. I don't know whether I care about the best equilibrium. In some settings, I think I do. It all depends on the setting. So one way of thinking about an equilibrium is a design question, almost the same as network design was without game theory, except there's a constraint, a constraint that your design has to be stable. That design question comes up in a lot of places, for example, if you think about what kind of software should Microsoft give us in our laptops, I'm using Microsoft, maybe many of you do, then it's reasonable to say that if there is a reason, really easy fix I can to my computer, and that way my computer will be a lot better than all of you guys' computer, I might not be socially nice enough to not to apply that patch. Uh, so it's better if Microsoft gives us a design that has the stability property. There is no easy patch. I can't change my, my, my all internet connection to take, take advantage of something that then makes you guys all suffer. But there's a design problem here. I did buy my, my, my software from Microsoft, and so did many of the rest of you also. So Microsoft does do a design here, a design that's probably reasonably constrained to be, to be stable, and that's what's modeled by the best equilibrium. Someone actually chooses the equilibrium for you and, he, and gives you a software with your machine that has the equilibrium in it. If it's not equilibrium, you probably will deviate, or many people will deviate. Um, oops. Okay. 
Um, so here's a simple example to see that this log k actually was necessary. So in this is an example. It's actually directed on the picture. The k users all want to go up to the terminal uh, t, and they all choosing between the personal pass costing 1 over i for user i versus a shared pass that roughly costs 1. As you all realize, the shared pass is a better ID. It's only costing 1. But unfortunately, it's not an equilibrium. Because I mandated this equal sharing, and the equal sharing mandate, the one guy that has the 1 over k cost is better off than if he, if it goes alone, than if he shares this other, the shared one, which is a little bit up from 1. And of course, once he deviated, of course, now the next, not only k minus 1 people around, and so now the last guy has the same experience. He's better off alone, a little bit better off alone. Then if it goes together, and so on all the way, they each deviate one at a time. The unique Nash equilibrium here is that everyone has their own pass. They all cost paying one, 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 one over i. User i pays one, one over i here for a total cost of the harmonic number of bad log k instead of the 1 plus epsilon that it would have cost to share. So indeed, this is the worst example. This is precisely the band that came out of our proof, even up to constants. Um, so the proof, of course, is what you think it is. Um, this is exactly the potential function. Uh, in our case, or in this particular case, the cost of an edge was a constant, c, and the potential function multiplied that by exactly this expression. So it's precisely the same band we get from the potential function. So let me stop here for a second. And I guess I'm going to spend uh, some of the remaining time trying to tell you about some results and directions with a bit less detail than I had on this one uh, on, on uh, directions that I think are interesting and directions that I, I and some other people have been exploring. So what I did so far is showed you a proof technique, namely um, that potential functions are good for proving bands on the quality of Nash equilibria. I told you without actually giving you details that in many cases, uh, this band is pretty sharp. That is, in particular, in the fair sharing game, it's exactly sharp. The example we had on the previous slide up oops, uh, was an example where uh, the unique Nash equilibrium is exactly the factor up from the cost that the potential function wants to predict. And in routing games, I gave you examples where uh, the band we get out, easily get out of the potential game is roughly pro proportional to the degree of the polynomial we're using or the, the steepness of the function we're using. And I told you without proving that the sharpest band here is d over log, is a little bit better. It's a, logarithmic, it's a, a little bit logarithmic factor better. In my eyes, there are two, one, two major limitations of uh, the potential function techniques, or maybe a number of major limitations. And what I want to do is, in the next couple of slides, or next 15 minutes, uh, try to tell you a couple of directions that we're pursuing to somehow take this class of games and get around the limitations of these potential functions. So one limitation of the potential function technique that we wanted to talk about the best equilibrium instead of the worst one. It's a pretty severe coordination problem to make users select the particular equilibrium I had in mind to make sure that they selected the good equilibrium. And I would be much happier if either the band would be about the worst equilibrium, or instead, it would be about a reasonable principle on equilibrium selection. That yes, there is this bad one, but decent users aren't going to choose this one. And that seems like a reasonable direction to pursue. And indeed, um, their, their research getting going in this direction. So first of all, let me tell you what the worst case is. The worst case for this network design game is exactly what we saw on the slide in the beginning, uh, k users knowing, not knowing to coordinate on the right thing. They coordinated on the wrong thing. They fact paying a factor of k more than they should. It's easy to see that this is indeed the worst case, except that it's a very bad worst case. Because no player will, in this kind of game, ever play single-handedly more than the optimum. Like, you know, worst comes worst, he has to buy the whole optimum network all by himself. It can be worse than that. This is because the cost monotone goes, go, the toll cost goes up with congestion. 
So a factor of number of users is indeed as bad as it can be, except that I'm not too happy with that one. Um, so what we would like to do is somehow define a better co a solution concept here, something that allows you to um, say that that, well, that equilibrium didn't count. So one natural direction that some of us have been pursuing is allow people to cooperate. So say, let's say it's a cooperative game. Now, what do I mean by a cooperative game? And I have to point out that if I only knew what I meant by a cooperative game, I probably um, would have given a whole talk on just on, on my meaning of cooperative game. Uh, I give you some beginnings of what I think about in a cooperative concept. So the natural, what, what could you mean? What, what's so hard here? What's hard about cooperative game? So one version of cooperative game would be what's often called the strong Nash equilibrium. Strong Nash equilibrium would be that instead of in a regular Nash equilibrium, I allow one user to change his strategy. I'm not allowing any number of users to change their strategy. Uh, what do I mean by any number of users? I mean that they all change their strategy, but they all have to agree to change their strategy. That every single one of them should be better off and changed than before they changed. Otherwise, they probably won't agree to cooperate. This is indeed a very nice equilibrium concept due to Amman. Um, what I'm going to tell you maybe is in, oops, sorry, backwards, is in a second, is that a triple of people, Epstein, Feldman, and Mansour, last year uh, showed a very uh, nice theorem to show that in strong equilibria, the worst price of energy for strong equilibria you can get is that log k we have seen, and it's going to come from the very same example. Um, so that says that strong equilibrium is here significantly better. Not too surprising. If they were allowed to cooperate, it was a coordination game. They should do better. Um, so even though that's not my result, I will give you at least one hint of how this is going. First of all, the bad example is, again, the very same network with the, one over I, the option 1 over i for user i. Um, indeed, this is the unique Nash equilibrium. It's also the unique strong, it's a strong Nash equilibrium, the unique strong Nash equilibrium. Um, the argument goes roughly like follows. Um, for there must exist a user, if you think of any strong Nash equilibrium, there must exist a user that doesn't want all of them to switch to the optimum. There is a user that pays no worse in the strong Nash equilibrium than it paid in the optimum. Right? So cheating a little bit, you might think that that guy being roughly about 1 over k fraction of the opt. I'm slightly cheating here. But once we left him out, we could try to move the other guys to the optimum. There are k minus 1 people there. Maybe all of them could move to the optimum. That would, of course, make the cost go up a little bit each. But no matter what, we could make, make them move. Again, there exists one guy that won't want to move. And you re repeat this multiple times and use the potential function, which I probably won't do right now. And you get that you can get a band, which suggests that this simple network is indeed the worst case example. If you think about the coordinated way of these users moving out of the strong Nash equilibrium on the example, this is exactly what's happening there. We can make, from the strong Nash equilibrium, I can make all of them want to move out to the optimum. There will be one objecting guy, the last guy, who won't like this. Then I can make one less, less of them move out. Again, there will be one objecting guy. And it turns out, um, as maybe I won't show the proof, that there exists. Um, that any strong Nash equilibrium has this property, the strong Nash equilibrium in this game are as good as the, the best Nash equilibrium we had. This is nice, uh, but strong Nash equilibrium have a big, big handicap. And namely, they tend not to exist. It was really kind of neat in, in that network it existed, but in most other networks it doesn't exist. So let me maybe convince you of this fact. So here is a little network with a red user and a green user. The red user wants to connect um, two red dots, and the green user wants to connect the two green dots. And they both have sort of two options. One way to the only unique Nash equilibrium is that they build separate paths for themselves, which maybe uh, I should put up, and it costs five units for each. And the only other option each of them has that at some part of the pass, they can help the other guy a little bit. As it turns out, that's a little costly for them to do so. And let me show you what that is. 
they can switch to, instead of using the direct connections for costing two for them, using an extra edge, uh, which makes their cost go up a little bit, but the other guy's cost go down. Uh, this, co this particular solution I put up here is costing four each. So obviously, the second, the previous one was not a strong Nash equilibrium. Oops, wrong direction. Was not a strong Nash equilibrium because they could both switch to this one. But this isn't a strong Nash equilibrium either because it's not even a Nash equilibrium. Namely, each one of them is even better off if they don't cooperate. In fact, what's really happening here that I managed to phrase the prisoner dilemma as part of this cost sharing game. What's really happening here that both players have two actions. One is a little bit better for them. The other one is much better for the neighbors. Amy, uh, if they cooperate and choose the much better for the neighbor, if they both do that, that's the optimal solution. But that's not an equilibrium. So that's a typical example of a place where strong Nash equilibrium ex doesn't exist. For example, in prisoner dilemma, it doesn't. And in fact, in most games doesn't. It was, we were lucky that that particular von Graff had an Nash equilibrium. So here is something I'm actually sort of proposing as an equilibrium concept instead. And we'll tell you a little bit more about this. So I don't have a good equilibrium consent for cooperative games. So I want to propose that we don't have one. And instead, we try to get away without this. So this is a schematic picture of what I might want to mean. So on the bottom here, I have a coordinate system that is supposed to be not so meaningful or not so concretely meaningful on the level of coordination. What I mean is, full coordination is that someone enforcing coordination and we have the socially optimal design. And no coordination at all is the plethora of Nash equilibria, which is a little cheat to call that no coordination, but no cooperation is Nash equilibria, is a non-cooperative game. And somewhere in between, there might be sort of fuzzier kinds of corporations. So far, we looked at price of energy and price of stability, which evaluates the possible solutions on the no coordination sites against the fully coordinated optimum. Uh, and what I want to look is what's in the middle of this picture, in the middle stage, when some people cooperate and some other people don't cooperate. I looked at Sto Strong Nash as a cooperation solution, but that has these existence problems. So let me not think about that. But instead, what happens if small groups cooperate? So this is, I think, a quite natural idea for anyone in sort of many other areas of computer science, like distributed computing. It's usually assumed, and this is back in a world where users cooperate to hurt each other, that they're, they're only small groups can do that because it's too hard for big groups to cooperate. So I want to call up the same notion here and say only small groups can cooperate. And I want to think of this sort of line between cooperation group size versus the quality of solution. What happens to the quality of solution as bigger and bigger groups co cooperate? Um, to make sure I'm clear on what the game theory here is, I'm not modeling how these groups are formed. I'm sort of assuming that everyone cooperates with their close friends. And whoever their close friends is, that's outside the game. It's a priori given. People happen to have close friends. And they're going to cooperate with that. And I'm not modeling that. There's some arbitrary groups that arrive out of nowhere, i.e. out of your personal friendships, and cause people to cooperate in those kind of settings. And I want to know that when this cooperation arrived, did the solution get better or worse? Um, now, maybe there are enough people with better economic intuition than mine, uh, so I don't dare to ask what you think. I will tell you what I was surprised at that, of course, it gets worse. If the wrong small group cooperates, that's bad for social welfare. It would be better if they didn't cooperate. Um, so the picture sort of looks like this. When everyone cooperates towards the common goal of optimizing social welfare, then, well, that's, that's dictatorship. We're optimizing social welfare. But if small groups optimize to, co to optimize their own personal social welfare, namely the group social welfare, that actually can real, uh, lead to bad solutions. A very simple example of this, for those of you who share my bad intuition, is a scenario depicted here with two class of users. Uh, and it will be very powerful without looking at the details to see that this has to be bad for us. There's a raft class of users that chooses between two paths. 
And a blue class of users that's very powerless and only has one, cho one, one choice. You might think the blue guys are not, not players, but I think of them as players. They only have one strategy each. They have to choose the blue pass. And what makes it, makes it easy to understand what happens is that, well, these blue guys are not actually players, right? They have one strategy, but the red guys do uh, have multiple strategies. In, in a Nash equilibrium, when the red guys are a million little red guys, they choose to avoid the blue players and find their own flow. But if they all cooperate, they can actually spread out. This is the two-edge network in disguise that you already have seen before. And they can sacrifice a few of their players in order to optimize social welfare. What they're not thinking of that while they're sacrificing a few of their own players, they're even more dominantly sacrificing all the blue players. They're doing a lot of damage to all the blue guys. The blue guys, unfortunately, are powerless, and they can't retaliate, so social welfare went off. Um, you can make this example is not particularly bad, but you can make it arbitrarily bad. Uh, what we could do on the positive side is, at least in one setup, quantify that this happened because of the power difference between the users. So I had two classes of users here, a powerless set of blue users that had no access to, to, only had one strategy, it was barely a player, and a class of red users that can choosing between two strategies, and what happened is that the red users took advantage of the blue users that were powerless. If I make the exact same game um, in a setup, where every user, it's a symmetric game, every user has access to the very same set of strategies, then it turns out that in any setup, no matter what kinds of groups cooperate, the solution always gets better. So what do I mean here? Um, I guess there are two versions of the theorem I put up on the slide. One is a continuous version, that the users are very small. They're choosing between multiple options. They are they, they're continuously small. They're choosing between ma many options. I, you can make arbitrary groups of people, and the groups, co groups fully coordinate. The solution improves. In contrast, if I think of users as, as individual humans, and I think of an atomic congestion game, that is, uh, I think of this room as you guys saw users. You all have cho choices to the same options, and I make you guys in arbitrary groups again, given by your friendships, cooperate with each other, then there is a little uh, awkwardness and social welfare can get a little bit worse, uh, in particular by a factor of two, which maybe is not so little bit. Uh, but I can think of, especially in light of the proof that I won't be showing here, uh, you can think of this factor of two as sort of a rounding error off of a continuous version where this doesn't happen. Uh, there's some awkwardness because of discrete choices. Um, so I guess in order to give everything a cutesy name, which maybe is common practice in computer science, we decided to call this the price of collusion. That is, by how much worse life gets if arbitrary groups cooperate. Um, so in summary, I guess I, I talked about a number of issues, um, mostly all phrased around potential, fun potential games. Uh, starting with the price of energy and, and stability in network routing and for, uh, network formation games. Both are very simple potential games, and I took very heavy advantage of potential games that allows you to prove such results. I talked a little bit about what coordination, whether coordination helps. Um, um, and I guess here are some issues that I wish I had time to talk about or wish I spent more, more of my upcoming life thinking about. Um, I hinted at direct, indirectly about equilibrium selection. There are other directions of uh, saying that that idiotic way that the users chose that bad coordination, that won't happen. They have to be given the bad coordination to stick to it. No matter how you put those users on the map, they're not going to coordinate on the bad thing. Okay, there's some uh, beginning work by some by myself and some by others. Uh, my work is joined with uh, Bobby Kleinberg and a student of mine, uh, Georges Pilarius, uh, in trying to suggest that people will not select the wrong thing uh, if they use some reasonable strategies for equilibrium selection. Um, I also um, 
I have to admit that why potential games are beautiful because it gives us the potential function that we love using. Almost every game in the world is not a potential game. So we should learn something from this exercise and take it over to non-potential games. Um, there are a number of other game, classes of games that people have looked at. I personally started to look, put money in the business that is thinking about buyers and sellers and, and, uh, and, and prices in a couple settings, one of which is joint with uh, Larry Bloomy, David Isley, John Kleinberg. Um, we started to think about network formation where instead of, and I guess here is my low picture of, I guess, European trading network from 800s, where your interest in forming an edge has to do with money you make, which is a different incentive than what I gave you before, where you had to form the edge. And there are many other games that others, and to some extent me too, have thought about, resource allocation games, service provider games, and randomized road balancing games. The particular, the, each of them have pretty big literatures. The particular names of authors I put under the games is not necessarily, by, by far not the first people who thought of these games, but instead people who proved uh, price of energy bands on these papers. But I'm trying to suggest here that the concept of price of energy, even though I use potential functions to derive it, is much more broad than this. And we need to work on understanding um, to what, what is the general framework of context that applies. Potential functions in one of them, uh, but there are other games, uh, and here are my, a few of my favorite games, uh, where other people managed to prove very nice par, uh, price of energy bands, and it gives me hope that there is a broader general framework here that one can do this in, and I'm going to stop with this. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah. Um, so I was a little bit curious about the network formation games. Mm -hmm. And so you make the assumption that everybody who uses a link will share that cost of it, which that seems where you might want to change things to. And also, it doesn't seem that that's a Shapley value to you. Or, I mean, that's not how I would model the Shapley value. So uh, I guess there are two questions here. How did the Shapley value come in as a name? And um, let me answer that one first, and I come back to your second question. So I. Yeah, I specifically asked to take the Shapley value discussion off the table because exactly, so it's not the Shapley value of this game. If I think of it as a, as a motivation for fair sharing, which is certainly the, the um, CCOM paper that I'm referring to here, is motivating it through the Shapley value. If you already have the network, it's given, and the game is a cost sharing game. How are you going to share the game cost of this given network? then the Shapley value of that game is exactly the value I'm using. But I'm not using the Shapley value of the network design game. I'm sort of mandated that once the network is up, they're going to share with the Shapley value. It's a policy statement or a design feature at this point, not the Shapley value. I agree. So maybe I shouldn't use Shapley value. Equal sharing. Um, the second question you're pointing at is one of the maybe dominant weaknesses of equal sharing is that if I have to buy a link, and I'm a little startup company, and my corporate on the, on the link is some huge big company. Uh, you name your favorite huge big company, IBM. I don't know. I already picked on them. Then is it reasonable to equally share? And uh, certainly, I have to agree with Vince that, for example, traffic proportional sharing seems more reasonable than equal sharing. Um, the bad, there are two bad news with traffic proportional sharing. The one bad news that probably you, you can guess from the, the talk you just saw, that it's mathematically problematic. It fails to have an, that, that sharing process fails to, fails to have equilibrium often. It is not guaranteed to have an equilibrium at all, or at least not a deterministic one. Um, and it doesn't have the nice mathematical properties that potential functions give you. So I can't, even when it exists, I can't give you any of this analysis. On the second side, which is, comes from the Estrin uh, paper that's earlier, measuring is a little problematic for these network guys. They have these routers that implement certain things, and they don't want to measure. That's the last thing they want to do. They don't want to measure the traffic. They want something that's really simple to implement. 
And equal sharing is easier to implement than traffic proportional sharing because it doesn't involve measuring traffic. So they actually argue for this simpl on simplicity and not on the game theoretic properties. Yeah. So I have a question about the game that um, you showed that the routing game became a prisoner's dilemma with your nice little. Yeah. Can go back to it. So I'm wondering if you thought about pricing in that context. So if the the people who were, well, might get back to it. Oh, sorry, it's too far. There it is. So if you were thinking, if I understood this, um, if you if you have you thought about pricing in this context, so that the the people who are providing the link over which. The, the green person's getting back to the green person by going over the red guy's yeah. link. Have you thought about pricing in this context? If, if the red guys, or the green guys, whoever you, you know, focus on, are pricing for that traffic, could you get out of this? I mean, I would think you could. I mean, have you just thought about not just sharing, but pricing? So what you mean is that the providers can offer a, a, a cost share. Like you say that I'll go over to your link if you only pay me this much. Right. Or I'll, yes, I'll, we I'll have. allow you access to this yeah. if you pay so this. So the version we thought about is that, so here I, I, it's, I guess coming back to Vince's principle, something that maybe is even harder to implement, the traffic proportional sharing, would be just negotiate the share. On every edge, if Vince and I need to share something, we need to put up the cost for running it, and Vince and I should run a side bargaining business to agree. So I can make that part of the game. I said, OK, the game is actually more complex. On every edge I want to use, I not only should say that the edge I want to use it, but say I want to say how much money I'm putting up towards the edge. And the edge is actually functional if we put up enough money. If we didn't, then I don't know, things will blow up. I want this not to happen in equilibrium. So that's a, that's a version of this game where bargaining is part of the game. It doesn't actually explicit bargaining, but agreeing on the shares is part of the game. As with many games, uh, again, the trouble is equilibrium will fail to exist. It will exist in this particular network. It won't exist in others. If you play that game for everyone wanting to access the provider, that is, they're not connecting arbitrary nodes in the network, but there is a source of goods, like the uh, central database. And they all want to pay towards the central beta database. That is, they're all connecting to a single source then it turns out to have very nice properties. Uh, but if it's an arbitrary connection, as in the picture suggests, or as my story suggested, then it again has equilibrium problems. It doesn't have equilibrium. It's also very complicated. So it has the same implementation problems that um, fair sharing was originally suggested for. If, if um, there was ownership over the links, so if people own the links, and then they can exclude access to them. Then, they can, yeah. then the bargaining process becomes yeah. much simpler, right? And then you'd be able yeah. to, your prices would be perhaps better pinned down. Yeah, but that's a good, that's a good suggestion. If, they, if people own links, then that would be a better, I don't know, I haven't thought about that. I, I was thinking without actually anything written, so not sufficiently deeply to have anything good come out of it, to somehow mandate a particular bar bargaining. Like, not that right. they just name a number that I pay five bucks and Vince pays one box, and unfortunately the toll was not enough. But somehow mandate a particular um, bargaining method for how they shared it, other than fair sharing, right. Right. Um, which somehow seemed more reasonable. Uh, but I don't have anything good to recommend on that access. So that would be sort of halfway between what we did think about and what the fair sharing is. Uh, mandate a particular bargaining mechanism for how to agree on the shares. Oh, but I don't know. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Back to the link sharing, how much you are charging someone. So I, I was thinking of uh, instead of uh, uh, just splitting it equally among all the people sharing the links, have you looked at something like uh, you charge people according to how critical that edge is to them? So if. Uh, I have not. Uh, so if I don't use that edge, my cost increases. Oh, I see. Repeat the question. Uh, whether uh, the question was whether I thought about uh, somehow making charging people somehow dependent on how important the edge is for them, uh, and the, uh, it's a good question. Again, it's something that's hard to implement. So in the, if you think of this as something that the networking community wants to think of in terms of the internet, they don't want to think about these things because they want really simple policies. 
and either this or even the measuring traffic sink is harder. Uh, they, they have this unwritten rule of life that it has to be very, very simple. It has to be something that it, it, it's, the routers can keep track of. Um, so in that excess not. As a game theory question, it sounds like a nice question, and I haven't thought about that. So, I mean, does this argument that the routers, that everything has to be simple, does that apply in the network formation context as well? Maybe not. I mean, the question is whether, whether it, it, I'm, I'm con convoluting two things, which maybe is a little unfair to convolute. One is that what we don't want to do in the internet is measure traffic, because we don't have enough equipment in a network to measure traffic, and we wouldn't want to invest an awful lot of money to upgrade our equipment to make it capable of measuring traffic. Uh, so traffic measurement's a bad idea, uh, probably. Uh, the second question is that the, the agreement policies uh, those they have to be very simple and, and simple enough for routers to implement? Possibly not if it doesn't depend on things that the routers need to do. I mean, the agreement itself can be more complex. They're actually ISs and people own them and they negotiate. Uh, as long as the cost sharing does not depend on things that makes the router do something that we don't want routers, that the router's currently not capable of doing, as in measuring traffic. exclude the case when there is a class of users who wants to actively hurt the other users usage of the network is there any game that can be formulated between those two classes of users in that particular case or is, is that uh, is there a way to change the network formation process so to make that kind of denial of service attack harder um, so a question is does, does any of this game theory happy to model denial of service attacks. Um, in one sense, yes, even though my work doesn't right now. Uh, in other sense, not. Uh, the part that is that actually game series, or this sort of game series is relatively happy to model, even though I didn't do it here, here allowing some people to, to, in this particular setup, to choose bad strategies. Uh, what I should have said, and I think some, many of the theorems stay true if I say that, is that the people who don't choose these stupid strategies, they can't hurt those, like, they at least as well off as if the other guys wouldn't be there. Yeah, this is a game where coordination is good. If these guys can only hurt me by not coordinating with me, it wouldn't make my life any worse than if they haven't been in the earth in the first place. Um, there are many situations of this sort where, where, where serums like this can be proven and relatively easily, or sometimes only if the number of malicious users is small. Uh, what's harder to do, and what's the heart of real denial of service attacks, that all of a sudden many more users show up. Um, this is not a problem here because it's a coordination game, but certainly on the routing and delay game, it's a big problem. Uh, if denial of service attacks simply caused by some users choosing a bad pass, well, in my examples, these were simple networks. You couldn't choose such a bad pass. But even one user could all of a sudden choose a zigzag kind of guy, go cause an awful lot of traffic all by himself. And in real denial of service attacks, you actually generate many more copies of yourself to generate all that traffic. So the number of users went up. Um, there is really not, I mean, in the congestion model, uh, if there are people generating congestion, then there will be congestion. There's not much I can say about that. Uh, in cost sharing, that's better because their cost goes down, individual cost goes down with, with congestion, so there they're actually not harmful. So it depends uh, what context. Yeah. Do you happen to know for your other games or for all of them whether repeated games increase or decrease the cost of anarchy? If you're going to repeat it? You mean if you think of it as an infinitely repeated game? I actually don't know. Good question. Uh, yeah. The worst case, equilibrium will be at least as bad. So it won't, it won't improve things. So possibly can make it worse. I mean, all, all kinds of things become equilibrium in repeated games. So a general, the conventional wisdom would be that it must make it worse. Yeah. Because all kinds of crazy things become equilibrium when when it's an infinitely repeated game and possibly a real bad guy. But okay. one thing that might not apply here is that my players don't have 
um, good enough punishing part to do that. The argument usually is that because the, 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 my strategy will be that if you don't follow my prescribed bad strategy, then I punish you. But I, might, I didn't give my players enough power to punish each other. So I'm not sure. I don't know. Possibly it, it doesn't get worse. I'm not sure. Do you know the answer, Rachel? Or? Uh, no, I was just, I mean, the folk theorem tells us that any out, pretty much any outcome is possible. So I actually think that's not true. Because the folk, or, or it's true as a folk theorem. But as folk theorems go, they often use a power that might not be there in a concrete setup. Mm -hmm. This folk theorem uses the power that I can pa punish the participants. I can do something that's really, really bad for them. But if I, all I do is rot, what on earth can I do? I can't make your life really bad. Well, you can just use min-max payoffs, right? And then that will give you your worst outcome. Yeah, that's true. I could do that. That's true. If you're patient, I can if you're patient in enough, even a little bit bad hurts in a lot. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, so. Yeah. True. But I guess, honestly, I haven't thought through what happens with the repeated game here. Yeah, because you could learn the costs in the repeated game as well. Even if you're not explicitly making measurements, you can eventually, even the costs are unknown, you can learn them and then find your min-max that way, right? Something True. of this sort. That's why, you know, in a sense, any outcome is possible, because if, if users have enough memory, they can just keep track of what's happening, try some stupid moves for a while, and then sell on a, a policy to punish others. Right? If it's a repeated game. Yeah, if it's a repeated game, yes. So a different repeated setting that I did think more about is if the users, you assume that the users, or at least the large majority of users, uh, engage in a no regret learning algorithm. Right. That's not a repeated game, because I mandated that they do this sort of myopic no regret kind of thing. Um, it, it's reasonable to believe, though I can't prove it, that if the users do this in the in in, in out of some reasonable start, the in the cost sharing game they get to the good equilibrium. For example, I put them up to the to play one at the they don't I don't want them to show up in the coordinated bad equilibrium because then they're stuck. So for example, I make them start one at a time. Um, a new person, one person shows up, he does something. Then another person shows up, he does something. Maybe they do some iterations, and while they're learning to behave properly, some new fellow shows up. Yeah, there's something reasonable sequence of people showing up. The only thing I'm mandating is that they didn't start on that damn bad correlated equilibrium. They showed up one at a time. There is one paper um, that's sort of proof of concept. It didn't get that far that if I actually sequence the order in which the optimizations happen, then you don't get to the bad correlated equilibrium. I think, and they think so too, you never get to that bad equilibrium, whether you sequence it or not sequence it. Is. This is EC06 and ORDA, and I'm not sure I'm good at quoting the original paper. But they, they give you a particular sequence. One person shows up at a time, and they have to make steps in this particular sequence. Basically, one believes that no matter what they did, they can't find a bad equilibrium. It's quite, I mean, it's a particular unfortunate coordination. They, not, they wouldn't coordinate on that if they employ learning behavior. Or if they do actually best response, then neither. Uh, OK, thank you very much.